Okay, everybody, let's get started on uh, lecture five. So if the last few people want to come in and find a seat, and that is your cue to stop talking. Thank you. As a reminder, um, I have asked that laptop users use the, the left hand, for you guys, the left hand side of the room. Um, just as a reminder for that, it helps stop, uh, distract the other people around you who might not be using one. So today we are going to talk about more local scale. Really so far we've been focusing on really big picture stuff. We've been focusing on global scale factors that affect our global temperature um, and our climate. But really what we're going to do is start narrowing that down. We're going to talk about weather. Remember, there were five things that affect weather, and temp or sort of that define weather, and temperature is one of those. And so what we're going to look at today is a number of different factors that affect our temperature. And so to begin with, we have a little bit more theory about how energy is transferred, because that transfer of energy is what controls temperature. But then we're really going to sort of start thinking about, well, what might make it hotter here in Los Angeles than, say, up in New York for certain parts of the year? Why doesn't that necessarily always hold true? So that's what we're going to do today. But first, who saw the lunar eclipse last night? Woo! It was really fun, right? So, yeah, it was... Uh, it's something that I didn't get a chance to see in England because it was always cloudy. So the last time it happened there, I didn't get to see it. So we had a lunar eclipse. And for those of you that stayed up till just after midnight, you saw that as soon as that shadow moved across the moon's surface, the moon itself, it didn't go completely black. It actually went really red. It went really, really red as well. It was so cool. Anyway, so my question for you is, thinking about what is happening during that lunar eclipse. So remember that what's happening is that the Earth is ending up between the Sun and the Moon, and so it's blocking that light. So why did the Moon go red? Can you think back to what we did on Thursday and think about where did we say that, sort of, why did we say that at certain times the sky went red and why? So that's my first challenge of the day. Speak to your neighbor and see if you can remember, see if you can think about what might be happening to make the moon go red. OK, let's see what people think. So there is a majority, and the majority would be right, which is good. So it's rally scattering. So let's think for a second about what's going on. So do you remember we said that rally scattering in our atmosphere is why our sky is blue, right? So we are getting energy from the sun, but say the sun is over in that part of the sky, we, see, we still see blue light coming from, say, that part of the sky. And why is that? It's because those little gas molecules in our atmosphere are interacting with that incoming light, and they preferentially scatter in all directions the blue light, okay? And so what happens is we said that at sunset, why we see that sort of line of red down at the bottom of the horizon is because the, that light has had to travel through such a big thickness of atmosphere that a lot of that blue light has been scattered away. And so if we're scattering away the, uh, the blue side, what we get left with is the red light. So now let's think about the moon. So what happened last night was that we saw a full moon, right? It was a full moon. And that's because the moon was sort of facing us, and the light that we see coming from the moon is sort of reflected back at us. It's sort of sun's energy that hits the moon and comes back to Earth. But what happens is if the sun gets in between that, then the light coming from the sun gets cut off. But not all of it gets cut off, because a certain amount of it is sort of scattered through Earth's atmosphere and so it, it casts sort of this sort of light behind at the moon. And so all of that red light basically is traveling and being and sort of through Earth's atmosphere, and all the blue light is being scattered away. And so the red light that makes it through Earth's atmosphere and is scattered out beyond into space is what hit the moon, and it turned it this really, really red color. Okay? So it's exactly the same thing that happens at our sunset. It just happened behind the Earth to the moon as well. So it's very, very cool stuff. And it'll happen again in October. There's also a partial solar eclipse later this year, so look out for that. 
So what did we start talking about on Thursday? We really went through all of those factors that control our planetary temperature. So we said, first of all, the solar luminosity, that's where our energy is coming from. If that changes, our global temperature will change. The second thing is our distance from the sun. We are likely to be warmer than, say, Jupiter, because that energy is less spread out by the time it reaches us. We're getting more of that energy per meter squared than by the time you get out further in the solar system to Jupiter, where that light is sort of spread further out. Then we have the atmosphere. So of that incoming radiation that hits the top of our atmosphere, how much of it actually goes into warming us up down here? We said, heard that a certain amount is just simply reflected back out to space. In fact, 30% of it is just reflected back to space and doesn't warm us up at all. And we saw that Venus and Mars had quite different values as a result of that um, for their albedo. But we do absorb a certain amount of energy. And because, therefore, the Earth has a temperature, we also act as a black body and radiate energy out to space. Okay, remember, anything above absolute zero will do that. But we are way colder than the sun, so the energy that we emit has a longer wavelength. It's in the infrared. That's why the police can track you down at night with their thermal imaging camera. Okay, that's how they work. So the incoming radiation from the sun is shorter wavelengths, the outgoing is longer wavelengths, and that is what results in our greenhouse effect. Because certain gases in our atmosphere, they're invisible to, to visible light, They'll, that visible light, that shortwave radiation will just travel straight through the atmosphere. But when the Earth tries to emit infrared energy out to space to balance out the energy that's coming in, then some of that energy will travel out, but some of it, quite a bit of it, will get trapped by the gases in the atmosphere. And they will warm up, and they in turn will emit energy in all directions. And some of that goes out to space, but a lot of it comes back down to Earth as well. So it basically recycles some of the energy close to Earth's surface, and it keeps us warmer than we would otherwise be. And if we didn't have the greenhouse effect on Earth, we would be frozen. There wouldn't be life on Earth. It would be too cold. The average temperature would be zero degrees Fahrenheit, which is really very, very cold. But really, the fundamental bottom line for this is, is that we are in energy balance. Okay? And even if we see a tiny, tiny difference, that's enough to really change the temperature of the, the planet. But in general, the solar energy absorbed is equal to the terrestrial energy we emit. Okay? So that's our bottom line. So if we're going to talk about temperature, this is pretty useless for all of you who lived in Southern California for most of your lives, because you really haven't experienced real temperature. Well, you have. But you sort of tend to get anything between maybe the high 40s up to, say, the sort of hundreds or so. It can get a lot colder than that. And so we, uh, we talked a little bit, and only a few of you had experienced zero degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but it can get even colder than that. And so I wanted to show you something cool that you might have seen this winter. It was a bit of a craze that was going on about what can happen when you get to very, very cold. So this guy's in Siberia. It's minus 41 degrees Celsius, let alone Fahrenheit. And what he's going to do is show you what happens when you boil water and take it in a pan. And he's going to fling it off his big balcony, having checked that there's no one underneath. OK? So what would normally happen? So normally, it would just fall to the ground. instant cloud. Okay? At temperatures that cold, there's very little water vapor in the atmosphere. And what happens is that boiling water, it splits into really small droplets as he throws it up in the air. And so what happens, I'll get rid of the strange YouTube suggestions. So what happens is that um, when those droplets break into smaller pieces, they can cool down much more quickly. Okay? And as they cool down, a number of them cool down so quickly that they actually freeze. And what you ended up with there was just a cloud. It was actually probably ice particles 
in the air floating along rather than water droplets that would hit the ground. Um, and this was done in the Midwest um, and in very cold parts of the US this, this year as well when the polar vortex struck and temperatures got really low. So there's lots of fun little uh, videos online and you can see that. Um, we'll also talk more about that little phenomenon when we talk about water vapor next week. So it can get really cold. So let's think about how we transfer energy around. So this is a little bit of a review because we've already talked about radiation. So radiation is hugely important for the Earth because this is the way that energy moves between two points without requiring sort of matter in order to do that. And so this is how energy arrives to us from the sun. It's traveling through space. There's no particles to transmit it. It can just travel in a vacuum. And so we said that this was important for our energy balance because we're getting energy in the form of radiation, but we're also creating our energy balance by losing energy in the form of radiation out to space. But on Earth, we can have other types of heat transfer going on. Remember, we had conduction, which is where energy will move through a solid without requiring movement of the solid itself. So if you put something sort of metallic, one end in a fire, and you hold on to the other end, sooner or later, that heat is going to travel by conduction up that sort of the, the thing you're holding, and it will, you'll feel that temperature, you'll feel warmth. Okay? And in terms of when we're thinking about the atmosphere, then energy does travel by conduction from the ground itself to the very, very lowest. If you're going to answer the phone, you need to move quicker than that. Anyway, so it's, we, the energy will, from that radiation will heat the lower part of the ground, and then we'll have conduction which transfers that energy to the very, very lowest layer of the atmosphere. Okay? The, the, the atmospheric molecule is right next to the ground. But then what we have going on is convection. And we have two types of convection going on in the atmosphere. And convection is the energy that moves due to the, the movement of that substance itself. So this can happen in gases, it can happen in liquids. And so if we think about our atmosphere, we have conduction transferring that energy up to the very sort of lowest level of those gas molecules. But then those gas molecules, as they gain more energy, they tend to spread out a bit. It becomes less dense. And so that less dense material rises up. Okay? This is exactly what happens in a hot air balloon. If you add heat to a hot air balloon, then those particles move apart. They become less dense and the balloon goes up. And so this is what can happen in the atmosphere. We just heat a certain part of the atmosphere, and that will rise. And as it rises away from the ground surface, it's no longer close to where it's being heated. And so it will cool down. As it cools down, it sort of compresses a little bit. And so it will sink back down, because it's more dense again. And that's what we call free convection. Okay? That's what you see in your pan of water and everything else. But in the atmosphere, we also have something called forced convection. So forced convection is where we have wind moving along, and it bumps into something. And it doesn't just give up and stop and go, oh, well. It's actually it's going to try and move around that object. And so some of that air, as it moves along, is going to be forced upwards. So for example, by a tree, by a building. And that forces that air to mix um, vertically. Okay? So free convection, it does it by itself. With forced convection, it sort of forced by movement, by interaction with other things uh, to, to move uh, vertically. So those are things you've heard before. Now let's think about something a little bit new. We're going to talk about sensible heat versus latent heat. Okay? So sensible heat is what happens when you transfer energy and something heats up. So for example, if I went outside and stood in the sun, my skin would start feeling warmer. Okay? It's an energy transfer from radiation or from the air that resulted in a change of temperature of my skin. Okay? It's the same thing when that radiation hits the ground surface and you feel the concrete outside in the middle of the day. It feels hot. That energy transfer has caused an increase in temperature. And so there are two things that control how much temperature increase we see. First of all is just simply the amount of energy that we transfer. If we transfer more energy, we're probably going to see a bigger increase in temperature. 
But the second thing is a property related to the certain, to the specific substance that you're interested in. So, for example, if we talk about water, it has a specific heat, which means that it has a specific value, a specific amount of energy that it requires to increase its temperature by one degree Celsius. Okay? So if we take one kilogram of water, we would need to put in 4,190 joules for each kilogram in order to get it to increase in temperature by one degree Celsius, same as one degree Kelvin. Okay? So thinking about that definition of specific heat, which is that amount of energy that we need, thinking back to Newport Beach and hanging out in the summer on Newport Beach, which do you think will have a higher specific heat? So I've given you the definition up at the top there. So which would have the higher specific heat, the beach sand or the seawater? Okay. So consult your neighbor for a second. Let's see if we have a consensus. So we do. We have a 75% split and the right way, which is also a good thing. So the seawater has the higher specific heat. Because which one gets hotter during the day? The sand or the seawater? The sand. At the end of a really hot day in summer, you have to sort of dance across the surface because it's really hot, right? And so you've seen a bigger change in temperature, even though both surfaces have had about the same amount of energy. And so that water requires more energy. It has a higher specific heat in order to change temperature. And that's a really good thing for us here in Irvine because it tends to keep our climate much nicer than, say, if you went inland to Las Vegas, where they don't have water nearby, and so they change their temperature um, both during the day and the night much more quickly. So we can do extremely simple calculations uh, with, to, sort of, to do with specific heat because if we say that we have one kilogram of water at 10 degrees Celsius, if we add... 4,190 joules to that kilogram of water, we're going to go from 10 to 11 degrees Celsius. Okay? If we instead add that same amount of water to 2 kilograms, then we're only going to increase the temperature of that by half a degree Celsius. Okay? So it's very common sense stuff. And then our middle example, if you see that we have our kilogram of water, which has a high specific heat compared to our kilogram of, say, sandy soil, that has a lower specific heat, we're going to see a bigger change in that, um, the temperature of that sandy soil for the same energy input. Okay? So it makes a lot of sense. It's common sense. It's things that we deal with every day. So double check me on this. Okay? So if we just round down to make our lives a little bit easier, and the math a little bit easier, if we assume that the specific heat of water is 4,000 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. If our water temperature starting off is 14 degrees Celsius, and if we get 12,000 joules per kilogram over a day, what will the final temperature of my water be at the end of that day? OK, okay let's take a look. Good. 85%. We're doing even better. Absolutely. So. If we just had 4,000 joules per kilogram, then our temperature would increase by one degree. We'd have a temperature of 15 degrees at the end of the day. But how many lots of 4,000 is in 12,000? Three. So we're adding three degrees Celsius to our temperature. So we're going to go from 14 to 17. Okay? So everyone feels confident with that? Yeah, silence all of a sudden. Okay. But there's an implication. So of all the common substances on Earth, water has one of the highest specific heats of anything. And the fact that it exists over such a large part of Earth's surface is really important for us. Because this map here is, is something that you might not be familiar with. So the pale blue color shows no change in temperature in that location between day and night. So you can see that for large parts of the ocean, we don't see much temperature change between the day and the night. And this is because the water has such a huge specific heat. It takes a lot of energy being added to that water to change its temperature. It also requires a lot of energy to be lost 
from that water before it changes temperature. So it's really very stable. It has a very stabilizing effect on Earth's temperatures. If you look in contrast at the land areas, you can see that they're all sort of orangey red. And unsurprisingly, what that's showing is that they're much hotter during the day than they are at night. So if the whole of Earth was sort of land, if we had no water, we would see much, much bigger contrasts between the nighttime and daytime temperatures uh, around the world. But the fact that we have this amazing sort of ocean that can store so much energy and that takes a really sort of a large amount to change its temperature means that we're much more stable than we otherwise would be. So now let's talk about something a bit different. Everyone can connect quite well with this idea that if we add, temperature, uh, if we add energy to something, it changes its temperature. But there is something else that goes on, especially to do with water, that's very important for the atmosphere. And it's an energy transfer that doesn't result in any change of temperature, but it does result in a change of phase or a change of state. Okay? So let's quickly review what our states are. So we have solid, liquid, gas. Okay? That's something that's familiar with everyone. And given that we're going to be talking about water so much in this course, I decided to give you a, a water-based example. So all substances have not just bonds that keep the molecules together, but also bonds that hold molecules, sort of individual molecules, closer together than they otherwise would be. And in some substances, they're relatively weak. Okay? But in water, those bonds are actually much stronger. We call them hydrogen bonds. And they keep those water molecules closer together than they otherwise would. It's one of the reasons, for example, that surface tension, like you can float paper clips on water because of the surface tension, because all of those molecules are held together really nice and tightly. And whether you're in a solid, liquid, or gas depends on some of those hydrogen bonds. In a gas form, then there might be a hydrogen bond as the, sort of, that forms really briefly and is broken again as two molecules move past each other. But really, they aren't there permanently. They only form very briefly. In liquid, those molecules are moving more slowly. It means that there's more time for those hydrogen bonds to exist, and some of them exist more permanently and hold some of those molecules together, and that's what forms our liquid. Once we move into a solid state, then those molecules really aren't moving very fast, and so those hydrogen bonds can form, and they can form much more permanently, and they lock together those molecules in the form of a solid. And in particular with ice, in this sort of hexagonal shape, which is why we have six-sided snowflakes. It's why if you look at, say, how many molecules there are per sort of unit area, you can see that ice is much more spread out than, say, the liquid, and it's why ice floats which is very unusual. Most solid versions of things will sink, but ice floats because it's this nice, organized, hexagonal structure with a lot of space in between. And so if we're going to change from one of these to another, say if we want to go from solid to liquid, then we need to break apart those hydrogen bonds between the molecules. We need to break those bonds. And so that requires a certain amount of energy being added. And that isn't necessarily changing how quickly those molecules are moving. All we're doing is putting energy in in order to break those bonds. And the same thing happens when we go from liquid to gas. In order to get those gas molecules or those mo molecules to move around freely and independently in the form of a gas, we need to break apart some of those hydrogen bonds that are there in the liquid. And that takes energy. And then we can go in reverse. If we take our, sort of our independent molecules and we allow them to form these hydrogen bonds, that actually releases energy back into the environment. And these are important things for how the atmosphere functions, but it also affects our day-to-day -day life. For a couple of examples we'll come to in just a second. So here is my graph that looks a little bit scary at first, but give me a second. So on my x-axis here, along the base, I have calories, which is just another way of writing joules. It's just a unit of energy. And then up here, you can see we have temperature. And this line represents what water would do as it does this. So for example, I start off at minus 40 degrees Celsius. As I add energy, then I increase the temperature of that ice. But then we hit zero degrees Celsius, and we know that's the melting point of water. And you can see that for a while, after I hit zero degrees Celsius, I can keep putting in energy 
but the temperature, that doesn't change. What does change is that we're going from ice into liquid. Okay? So this amount of energy after we hit zero and before we become liquid is the latent heat of melting. And then you can see that once we're a liquid, as we add energy in, as we add more energy, we're increasing the temperature again until we get to 100 degrees Celsius, which is the boiling point of water. And you can see that then we actually have to put in a huge amount of extra energy before we can go from being water at 100 degrees Celsius to being a gas at 100 degrees Celsius. Okay? And this is called the latent heat of vaporization. And it's called latent heat because it's basically storing that energy. That energy doesn't disappear, but it's stored. And so when we then go from gas to liquid again, that energy is released back. Okay? Does this make sense? Yeah? Okay. Um, and so I want you to notice that latent heat of vaporization. So do you remember our specific heat, the amount of energy that we needed to add to a kilogram of water to change its temperature by one degree was something like 4,190 joules per kilogram. If we want to evaporate a kilogram of water, we need to add 2,500,000 joules. It's a huge amount of energy. And what we're going to look at later this quarter in one of the discussion activities is going to be calculating sort of how much energy is released during a hurricane. Hurricanes, these amazingly powerful storms, are fueled by evaporation and then that condensation process in the atmosphere. And they release an enormous amount of energy. And you're going to sort of do some calculations and compare how much energy a single hurricane releases per day compared to how much energy we as humans generate per day. Okay? So that's our latent heat. Okay. And this is important to you because most people have ice in their drinks. And you put ice in your drinks in order to cool them down. So why does that ice cool, them, cool your drink down? It's not simply because that ice is colder. It's because of uh, a phase change. So you put ice cubes in your drink to cool it down. And why is that? So read through those. Think about it for a second. Yeah, we're getting better and better each time. This is a good sign. So yes, absolutely. So when you put ice in your drink, it's not cold as soon as you put the ice in, right? It takes a while to cool down. And that's because as that ice melts, it requires energy. Do you remember if we look back, we need to put a certain amount of energy into that ice in order to turn it from a solid to a liquid. And where is that energy coming from? It's coming from your drink. It's coming from the liquid form of your drink. Okay? So as those ice cubes melt, they take in that, that energy. And so your drink loses energy and it gets colder. Does anyone know another reason why, uh, for example, the latent heat of vaporization might be very important to us humans? Any sports people in the room? Sweating, absolutely. So this is important because it's how we cool ourselves down. Yesterday it was stupidly hot. If you went outside, you probably sweated a little bit, okay? And so your skin produces moisture. And what happens is as that moisture evaporates, it needs an enormous amount of energy to go from being a liquid into a gas form, okay? And so where is that energy coming from? It's coming from your skin. So these water vapor sort of molecules or these water molecules are taking the energy from your skin and evaporating and carrying it off into the atmosphere. Okay? And so that's how we cool ourselves down. And we'll talk more next week when we talk about water vapor as to why uh, this process means that the East Coast is so miserable in the summer because of that high humidity. We don't have that same evaporation process happening and so it's much more difficult for that energy to be carried away from your skin. Okay. So why is latent heat important apart from we like ice cubes to cool our drinks down and we like to cool down ourselves? Well, for the Earth system, it means this is the way that we transfer a huge amount of energy around the Earth. And that's because where it's warmer, we tend to have more evaporation. We're going from liquid to gas. Some of that energy that's present in that location is being stored in the form of those gas molecules. And then winds and other processes move those air molecules to those higher latitudes where it's colder, and so we get condensation and that energy is released. 
So water vapour and that high latent heat um, is really important for moving energy around the Earth. So, I told you that solar energy absorbed equals terrestrial energy emitted, right? But that is really only true over a global sort of area and over an, a sort of an annual cycle over one year, okay? And so we can get increases in temperature and decreases in temperature over time and spatially throughout the year because it's just that average uh, that has to balance out. And so here is a cool little map from NASA showing the, the degrees in Kelvin. I know it's a funny scale, but basically the redder colors are the hotter colors, okay, and the, the purple are the colder. And so you can see a suggestion at least of the continents there. And so what I want you to do for me, I want you to take two minutes, and the TAs can wander around as well, and I want you to write down three things that you observe about this map, three patterns that you see in terms of where the hot temperatures are, where the cold temperatures are, okay? And we'll see if we can explain some of these observations that you make for the rest of today, okay? So take a couple of minutes and uh, try and make some observations with your neighbors. Okay, everyone's gone quiet, which is usually a bad sign. Okay, so does someone want to give me an observation, something to do with how those temperatures are distributed about the Earth? Well, I know no one wants to, but will anyone? Yes. It's warmer. Is it warmer actually at the equator or around the equator? It's around the equator. We actually see this funny line, right, of cooler temperatures along the equator. So we'll see later on today if we can explain why that's happening. What else can you see? What else can you identify on there? Can you identify which the continents are? How? How can you work out where the continents are? <laughs> Everyone's being so shy. How can we work out where Africa is? It's really hot, absolutely, compared to the ocean around, which is not, okay? So one example might be that it looks like our ocean temperatures are often cooler than the land temperatures, okay? We definitely see that closer to the equator, it's warmer, and closer to the poles, it's colder. But we also see this really funny line running through the middle. If you look, let's see as a good example, if you look north of India, what are the temperatures like north of India? Cooler. Why might they be cooler there? It's the Himalayas, so we're going up in altitude. Okay. So these are all the different factors. So we can talk about global averages all we want, but really there's a variety of little local factors um, that affect it. Someone else over here made a really good observation that it looks like we're cooler on our side of the US than the other side of the US, okay, at least at our latitudes. And so let's see how many of these we can actually try and explain. Okay, so first of all, I have a question for you. What time of day is the hottest? So let's think about a still day. So let's think about a day not like today when we have lots of wind, but on a completely still day, when would be the hottest? So we've had a bit of a shift. And it's a shift in the right direction. It would be warmest at 3 p.m. And someone over here had a great explanation for me. And it's basically to do with even if the sun is most overhead and you're getting the most energy at that time, it doesn't instantly turn off. At 1 o'clock, you're still going to be getting a lot of energy, so it accumulates throughout the day. Okay? So let's take a look at my really horrible graph which shows this. Okay? So don't panic is the first thing to say. I want you to just look at one line at a time with me. So first of all, let's look at my red line on here. So my red line shows the energy that I gain in terms of incoming sunlight throughout the day. And so you can see that you're definitely right that that incoming sunlight peaks at noon. That's when the sun is most overhead. We don't have as much beam spreading. It's not traveling through as much atmosphere, things like that. So that's when we're going to get the most energy coming in. But what temperature is, it's a, it's a balance between that energy coming in and what we as the Earth are losing out to space. Okay? 
So you can do this yourself, and it worked really well last week, and it probably would work well today. Maybe around 5 or 6 p.m. when it's starting to cool down, feel the concrete that you're walking on or feel the concrete uh, on the side, and it will feel warm. And that's because it's radiating back this energy. It stored that heat during the day, and now it's radiating that heat back to space. And what the amount of heat that we radiate out depends on the temperature. So at night, when it is cooler, we're going to be losing less energy out to space. In the middle of the day, we're going to be gaining temperature, and so we're going to be radiating more energy. Okay? But really, the peak in that energy that we're radiating out doesn't happen until 3 p.m., which is the same time as our maximum temperature. Okay? And you can think about this a little bit like your bank account. Okay? So your bank account will keep increasing if you're earning more than you're paying out. Okay? And so what we're saying is that you would earn a lot of money at noon, but you would still continue earning money at 1 p.m., 2 p.m. In fact, you'd earn more than you lose. Okay? So let's have a look at our green line. Our green line is our temperature. Okay? And you can see that in the middle of the night, we're not gaining any energy from the sun because it's dark, but we are still losing a certain amount of energy which is being radiated out from the solid Earth. And so if we're losing energy, we're going to decrease in temperature. And we're going to decrease in temperature. We're not going to instantly start increasing as soon as the sun comes up because until the amount of incoming energy equals what we're losing, we're not going to start increasing our temperature again. So we start increasing our temperature just after sunrise when the amount of incoming energy that we're gaining from the sun is larger than the amount that we're losing from the Earth. And then after that point, then we're gaining much more energy from the sun than we're losing by radiating it out from the Earth. And so our temperature in green is going to increase. And it's going to increase until maybe about 3 p.m. And at that point, we're seeing that we're getting less energy from the sun, and so now that energy we're getting from the sun is equal again to the amount that we're losing. And from that point onwards, we're going to be gaining less energy than we're losing, and so our temperature will decrease. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So it's not necessarily what you think. And we could replace this bottom line that says midnight, noon, midnight. We could replace that with winter, summer, winter. It's the same sort of process that happens on long time scales as well. Okay? The temperature that we see is always a balance between what we're getting in versus what we're losing. And so in our summer months, we might see a net gain each day, an ever so slight net gain, whereas in the winter, we might see a sort of a net loss. Yeah? So, do you remember the, the Stefan Boltzmann law, which is that the amount of energy radiated is equal to the constant times the temperature to the power 4? So what we see is that as our temperature changes throughout the day, that will change the amount of radiation um, that the surface is giving out. Okay? And so what the energy loss, that blue line is paralleling that green line up there. Okay? Yeah? So, in terms of the, what we feel is warm, what we're feeling is sort of the air temperature, okay? It's probably, and that is really a balance between that energy that is being received at the ground, which is sort of what is also heating that air, which is moving by conduction, convection, and also the amount that's, that's being lost. So, it's sort of, it's a bigger picture type idea. <laughs> Sorry, I can't explain that very well. So, yeah, okay. So, let's move on to something that we've thought a little bit about already. We've thought about latitude, okay? And so what I want you to think about is absolute temperature. So is somewhere going to be warmer or colder? So here's my example, Miami versus New York. Hopefully everyone, everyone knows where those two cities are. Which city is going to be warmer? Miami, absolutely. Which is going to see the bigger range in temperature and why? 
New York, why? Yeah. It's further away from the equator. And do you remember, if we looked at our equator as we moved throughout the year, it was always getting 12-hour days and 12-hour nights. And so the amount of beam depletion and everything else isn't going to change very much. So if a city is closer to the equator, it's not going to have as big a change in the length of day. It's not going to have as big a change in beam depletion, things like that. So it's not going to see as big a change in temperature. As we move closer and closer to the pole, if you imagine the North Pole, it gets 24-hour days in the summer, 24-hour nights in the winter. It's going to be a really huge contrast in temperature at that location. And so the closer you move to the pole, the bigger the difference you see throughout the year. And that's something that I saw when I moved from England. It was sort of much more like 50 degrees north, 55 or so. And so it would be light until 10 o'clock at night in the summer. Whereas here, it's never really later than sort of 7 p.m. We're much more constant throughout the year. And so you're right. If we look at our temperatures, and it's plotted in Fahrenheit for you on the left and Celsius for you on the right, you can see that Miami is, in general, it's warmer throughout the year. But we also see less of a difference throughout the year. Whereas if we go up to New York, um, and that's in the, the red dotted line there, it certainly gets nice and warm in the summer, but it's also much colder in the winter. So there's this much bigger difference um, as we look across the latitudes. So that's our latitude. Now we have altitude. And we've already seen this graph a couple of times in a different form. And this is, again, showing the full height of our atmosphere in kilometers. Okay? And so you can see that down here in the troposphere, where we spend all of our lives, the average temperature is maybe about 18 degrees Celsius down here at the ground. But then as we go up in the troposphere, it cools down. So why does it cool down? Why is it cooler at the top of the mountains compared to here? It's because that this, our ground surface, is our heating surface. That's what's receiving energy from the sun, and that is what is heating the air above it. Okay? And so, if we want to think about a mountain, for example, a mountain might be one little surface, but it's actually surrounded by sort of air, open air. The rest of the ground surface is much, much lower. And so it tends to be cooler because it's further away from that heating surface. Okay? And it also affects the way that the temperatures change at night. And that's because at night, down here at ground level, remember our pressure is really high down here. We have lots of molecules, and they're all packed together due to the overlying weight of the atmosphere. And so any energy that the Earth is giving out at night is going to be absorbed by some of those gases that are here. Okay? And if there are more gas molecules, then they're going to be more effective at absorbing that outgoing energy and keeping it down here near the surface. If we go to the top of a mountain, it's also going to radiate energy out at night. And as it radiates out that energy at night, then those gases at the top of the mountain are going to try and, and, and absorb that energy. But at the top of a mountain, we've got less pressure. We've got less gas molecules. They're just going to be less effective at absorbing that outgoing radiation. And so that's why it gets so cold so quickly when you're sort of camping at the top of a mountain um, compared to down here at sea level. So this is altitude. Now, this is a new one. So this is sort of local features. So which room in your house is the warmest? There's always one lovely warm room, right? And where would it usually be? What side of the house? South facing, OK? Or in the evening, if it's west facing and it gets lots of sunlight. There are certain angles where you'll receive more um, light than others. And it's the same thing if we go into the natural world. For example, you can see on my top right-hand photograph, you can see that on one of those slopes, there's still a lot of snow left from the previous winter, whereas on the other, it's been melting away. And that's because that one is probably a south-facing slope. It gets more of that sunlight, in the northern hemisphere at least, for more of the day, whereas that other one is probably more in shade, in shadow. And so this sort of thing can affect our temperatures. There's a little town in Norway that's right in the depths of a valley, and it doesn't see sunlight, direct sunlight, for months and months of the year. And so they just raised enough money to put a big giant mirror 
on the hill opposite and it reflects into this little square in the middle of the town and they all went and had a party in this little square of sunlight. Um, and so things like that affect our local temperatures. You can see the same sort of thing even around here. You'll see different vegetation on different um, angled surfaces and that's again because of perhaps the amount of energy that they're receiving. It might change the amount of water. It might affect the temperature of the soil, things like that. And lastly, things like vegetation itself can affect our local temperatures. So would it be hotter in the nice open grassy meadow or in the forest during the day? Where would it be hotter, in the meadow or the forest? Has no one hung out in meadows and forests? In the meadow, why? Why would it not be as hot in the forest? It's, yeah, you're going to be in the shade, right? There's going to be trees. They're going to be absorbing some of that energy. And so that energy wouldn't hit your, the ground surface. What about at night, though? Would it, be, uh, would it be warmer in the meadow or in the forest at night? In the forest again, because of the trees. So now what's happening is we're trying to emit energy. More of that energy is being absorbed by the leaves and by the forest. And so it's keeping that warmer again. So vegetation can also have a big role to play in uh, controlling our local temperatures. This is a good one for our bit of the coastline. Things like warm and cold ocean currents. Our oceans are not just still bodies of water that sit there. They are constantly in motion. Um, and so we have warm and cold currents moving around the Earth. And in particular, we can see that there are certain patterns to those, and we'll come back to this later in the course, And when we talk about how the atmosphere drives um, the surface ocean circulation. But in general, you can see that whenever we have currents moving away from the equator towards the north or towards the south in the southern hemisphere, then they're warm, unsurprisingly. They're coming from the equator, it'll be warm water. If we have currents moving from up here, they're going to be cold. This is not surprising. But you can see that there's a general pattern, which is we get clockwise circular motion of our northern hemisphere oceans in the North Pacific, in the Atlantic. Um, but we also see this sort of counterclockwise motion of our oceans in the southern hemisphere. Okay? And we'll come on to that, sort of why that is um, later in the class. But it does control which side of the continents you see cold water moving past, and which side of the, the continent you see warm water moving past. Okay? So, I want you to think about these two locations. So, St. John's in Newfoundland, and London, um, so where I'm from. Okay? So, look at those two locations. Remember where they are. And now look at where the ocean currents are going. So, if we were just to think about latitude, okay, then they're sort of similar latitude. London might be a little bit further north than St. John's. And so if it's just based on latitude, which might be colder? London. If it's further north, it would be colder. But what is happening with our ocean currents? Okay. What do you think might be the case? Which do you think might be warmer? Do you think it might be London or do you think it might be St. John's? No one wants to say. London, yes, absolutely. And uh, hopefully for those of you that have ever visited Europe, you know that we don't have nice, pretty, snowy winters. That's all a complete myth that Hollywood makes up. It mostly is rainy and pretty miserable. Okay. Whereas up at St. John's, I mean, Arctic Canada almost, you're thinking really cold. And so if we look at sort of what's going on, then in London, we actually have pretty sort of, well, not warm temperatures, but warmish, okay, throughout the year. And especially in the winter, we don't really get that cold. And that's because we have this amazing warm current, this Gulf Stream that flows really far north, and it brings this warm water past our coast, and it tends to keep us much warmer than we otherwise would be. Whereas if you look at St. John's, can you see that thing? It's labeled the Labrador Current. You can see little blue arrows coming down the coast there, and that moves past St. John's. And what happens is that that means that they tend to have much colder winters. 
that nice energy that's coming from the ocean in London isn't sort of helping out St. John's, and so they have much, much colder conditions there. So how about us? How about Los Angeles versus Charleston in South Carolina? Um, and so these have about the same elevation, about the same latitude, um, and they're both on the coast. So which of these would have the warmer temperatures, do you think? So 67.32, it's not, not that good a split. What can you see moving past the California coastline? Cold water. You would have to be somewhat foolish to go out and jump in the ocean right now. It would be really quite cold. Okay, if we go to the east coast, you can see that that lovely Gulf Stream moves past the east coast, that warm water coming up uh, from the Caribbean, and it tends to be much warmer. Okay, and so you're right that Charleston in South Carolina tends to be warmer um, than Los Angeles. Okay, so let's come back to this idea that we had earlier on about the surface type. So we said that, for example, sand on soil had a much lower specific heat. It took less energy to change their temperature than water. So now let's think about two more cities. Let's think about Miami, again, down on the east coast. But now let's think about uh, Insula in Algeria, which is right in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Okay? So I want you to, to think about this for a second, and I want you to... Think about what their temperatures might look like throughout the year. So which of these two do you think would be hotter in the summer? What about in the winter? Which of those do you think would be colder? The other one again. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So if we look, in blue we can see Miami. Okay. And you can see that we have relatively sort of warmer winters and we have cooler summers. And this is to do with that moderating influence of the ocean again. The fact that we know that here compared to, say, I mean, we could do the same thing for here in Las Vegas, for example. We know that in the summer here, with that nice cool water moving past our coastline tends to keep us cooler. Whereas if you go to Las Vegas in the summer, it's miserable. It's really miserable. Okay? But in the winter, we have that water coming past our coast that retains a certain amount of energy. And so in Miami, we have this nice warm current flowing past it, which provides a certain amount of energy. Whereas in the center of the Sahara Desert, if we're not getting much energy from the sun, it can cool, cool down a lot because we can see a rapid change in temperature as energy is lost from the surface. Okay? So basically, the more central you are to a continent, the, the further you are away from water, the more extreme your climate tends to be. And so this is definitely true in the center of Asia, which is this enormous continent. You see a really giant contrast between the summer and the winter. And actually that contrast drives our monsoon systems, which we'll talk more about again later in the class. So we can see the same thing for Newport Beach versus sort of Tustin versus other parts. And so just as a reminder, we already said this idea today because we already looked at this map and we said, well, let's see, if we look along the, sort of the edges of our continent, we see it's a slightly paler yellow, whereas if we look, say, right in the middle of the Sahara Desert in Africa, there's a much bigger change. If we look in Asia, in the middle of that continent, there's a much bigger change between day and night, and you can do the same thing for sort of the seasons as well. Okay? So it comes back to this idea of high specific heat. And lastly, we have clouds. So last night, when you were outside looking at the blood moon, was it cold or was it sort of mild, warmish? I know, I was pretty cold. <laughs> so when a cloud moves across you in the day, does it get warmer or colder? Colder. But at night, we see a different pattern going on. Usually on nights when there's lots of clouds around, um, we tend to have warmer nights than others, okay? And that's again because we're having energy sort of arriving from different places. So in the day, where is our energy coming from? The sun. And so what the cloud is doing is it's blocking that incoming energy, it's reflecting more away. But when there's sort of at, at night, that energy that sort of goes into warming the air is coming from the earth instead. 
And so in that case, if we didn't have clouds, if that energy could escape out to space more easily, it would get colder. Whereas actually, those clouds act to trap more energy. So, let's think about two more cities. And now this one is uh, in the US, near the Great Lakes. We've got um, Grand Rapids in Michigan and Madison in Wisconsin. And I want you to have a look at this graph and think about which axis is which, what it's telling you, um, and tell me which one of these cities has more cloud in the winter, and what does that do to its temperatures? It's a bit of a split again, and you know what I'm going to do when there's this sort of a split. OK? I want you to turn to the person around you and tell them why they're wrong. OK? So <laughs> related to the question only. So let's take a look. That's somewhat better. OK, absolutely. So let's think about this. So which has more percent of possible sunshine? Madison. And so which is going to be cloudier? Grand Rapids. OK, it's going to reduce the amount of possible sunshine that it gets. So what does having more clouds do to its temperature? Is it increasing the temperature in the winter, or is it decreasing the temperature? It's increasing. So that second effect is more important, the fact that we have this layer that's trapping the outgoing radiation. Okay? And that makes a certain amount of sense, right? In the summer, you might affect, expect the first effect to be more important, the, the effect that those clouds have on the incoming radiation as we sort of see increasing radiation in the summer. But in winter, when we're not really getting much sort of hours of daylight and everything else, then it's really the, the trapping of that outgoing long wave radiation at night in the, sort of the dark hours is going to have a bigger effect on temperature. OK, great. So coming back to my lovely diagram, what do you think we have going along the equator that might get it to cool down a bit? Clouds. We just talked about it, right? OK. And look, if we look at our satellite image of, say, the Pacific Ocean, then what we can see is that we get this really nice consistent band of clouds right along the equator. And unsurprisingly, if we look at that, you can see where those clouds are actually cooling down the temperature. So even though we might expect the equator would be the hottest because we're seeing less beam spreading and everything else, then we have to take into account what's happening in the atmosphere. And in the atmosphere, we have this almost permanent band of clouds for a reason that we will come back to after the first midterm. Okay, we'll talk about why it's that much hotter in these areas either side of the equator rather than the equator itself. Okay, so if we put that all together, we can draw what we call isotherms. And these are just lines that connect up areas of the same temperature. So if you look, uh, for example, um, let's pick one that's nice and easy to see. If we look right in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean in July, you can see that this is sort of our 27 degree isotherm. Basically, anywhere along the, that line would have a temperature of 27 degrees Celsius at the surface. Anywhere inside that would have a higher. Anywhere beyond that, sort of in this area, would have lower. And then we hit another isotherm. Anywhere along this isotherm would have, I think it's 24 degrees Celsius. Okay. And so we can draw these isotherms, and you can see that in the oceans, we see this really quite nice sort of linear pattern as we change with the latitude, which is what we might expect. But whenever we have land in the way, whenever we have mountain ranges and all of these other things, it really tends to mess around a lot with those isotherms. You can see the effect of the, the land masses and the, the, um, the mountain ranges on those uh, isotherms. And you can also see that they change between January and July, which is unsurprising. Okay? So bottom line, we have a temperature distribution over the planet. There are some places that are hotter. There are some places that are colder. And that will change through time on a variety of scales from sort of days to months to years. Okay. So let's think about latitude again. If we look at the Earth and we measure the amount of energy coming in at any one particular latitude, like the equator or 30 degrees north or south, and we measure the amount of energy going out from that latitude, 
then we can see that around the equator, we have much more energy coming in from the sun than the Earth is actually radiating out to space. So we have what we call an energy surplus. We have this extra amount of energy. If we then go to, say, up close to the North Pole or the South Pole, sort of further out towards the edges, okay, then what we see is that we get much less incoming solar radiation than we measure coming out from the Earth. In those two areas near the poles, we have an energy deficit. Okay? And so what our climate system is doing, what the atmosphere is doing, what the oceans are doing, is moving that energy around. It's moving it from this area of surplus into this area of deficit. That is what is driving our atmosphere. That's what's driving our ocean. It's what's driving our climate system. Okay? The fact that we have the surplus in the, around the equator and a deficit in other areas. And so solar energy absorbed equals terrestrial energy emitted at all latitudes, okay? But if we look at those individual ones, we see something different. And it's really the movement of our air and our oceans that keeps these uh, latitudes in balance and keeps our global uh, energy balance. So let's move on from temperature now a bit. Let's think about something different. So variations in heating are equal to variations in air pressure. Because air pressure is basically what you get if you imagine all of those air molecules in our sort of atmosphere moving around, and every now and again they'll bump into something. And basically, how many molecules there are will exert a certain amount of force. So if you have lots of molecules in your sort of area and it's moving around and it, they frequently bump into something, they're going to exert more pressure. If they have more energy, if they're warmer and they're moving around much more quickly, they're also going to exert more force, more pressure on the walls of what they're in. Okay? And so if we see variations in heating and variations in temperature, we see variations in pressure. Okay? And this is sort of what we uh, see as pressure. Pressure equals force divided by area. And this is why it's a very, very bad idea to drive your car over these sort of spike strips you see them every now and again in car parks because you're putting all of this force, the weight of your car, onto a very small area, basically the spike of, your, of that nail. Okay? So large force over a very tiny area bursts your tire. This is not an experiment I am going to do in class. You'll be grateful to hear. So can you see that this girl has stood on a board, but that's actually a board of nails. And this guy is also lying on a board of nails. So why is there not blood and ambulances being called and things like that? It's because her force, her mass, is being distributed, not just on one of those little nails, but the board is distributing it so that there's a little bit on each of those nails. Okay? So I still think it would be very painful. There's no way you could get me to do this. Um, but it works. He's not impaled horribly. Okay? Um, and so if we can spread out that that area, if there's a larger area, um, then there's a smaller force. So don't pack up just yet. Because what we're talking about when we talk about movements of air pressure is wind. Okay. So I have my example for pressure. Okay. Give me a sec. Okay. Where is the higher pressure? Is it in my balloon or outside my balloon? Inside the balloon, if I let my fingers go, which way is air going to rush? Is it going to go into the balloon or out of the balloon? Out of the balloon. OK, well done. You can cope with winds. Because that's really what winds are. It's movement from high pressure to low pressure. If I blew this up balloon a lot, a lot, if I let it go right now, would it go very far? No. OK. If I let it go now, will it go quite far? Yes. OK. The stronger the difference in pressure, the stronger the difference between high pressure and low pressure, the more wind there will be. So more about this on Thursday.